Will Smith has walked the Green Mile. He's seen the inside of the execution chamber. But Earl Smith isn't a convicted killer. He just ministers to them. Smith was chaplain at San Quentin, one of America's most notorious prisons. For over two decades, he prayed with dozens of death row inmates. To make a positive difference, Earl started a baseball team and a choir. He even played chess with Charles Manson. In his book, Death Row Chaplain, Earl shares these and other true stories about bringing hope inside the walls of what some have called the most frightening place on earth. Earl Smith is here with us now. And Earl, we welcome you to the 700 well, thank Club. Thank you. You, as a part of your job, talk to, mingle with, get to know criminals, gang members. This could have been you. There was a time in your life when you were walking down the wrong path. Could have gone differently, couldn't it? Yes, Terry. I think, um, as I was share with a lot of people, and in my book I talk about, as I grew up, I had a lot of anger associated with my mom because I didn't know really the thing. Understandably. <laughs> well, I didn't understand a lot about my mom. That was mm -hmm. the thing. And I told my mom a couple days ago that the best thing that's happened to me was her. Wow. Uh, because I now understand what's going on. And yeah. when I think about my mom and all, my journey would not be what it is without my mom. And being a gang member, I was angry. Uh, the violence, I was, it was almost like transference. And I talk about that in the book. But yet at the same time, as I think about where God had me and where he has me now, as I told my mom, you know, he used her to get to where I, get He's me where I'm at. He's the God of reconciliation. Yes, he is, yeah. and I told her that. Wow, that's, I'm sure that was very healing to your mom. You said something interesting. As a chaplain, my job is to represent hope. San Quentin, I mean, how do you bring hope to the men who are there? Well, first of all, we talk about incarceration, and people think the prison is incarceration. In the book, I talk about the fact that prison is just detention. Guys are incarcerated before they get to prison. True. For me, as a man of faith, I have to tell them that there's something beyond the bars. There's something beyond being incarcerated, and that is hope. Yeah. That's the eternal hope in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You know, just walking into San Quentin, you were pretty young when you became the chaplain there. What were you, 27 or something like yes. that? To be able to walk into a place where there are some people who've been hardened by the hard knocks of life and have them accept you, how did you do that? Well, I think a lot of them were just like me, so it wasn't difficult. I understood. Was part of it that you didn't see yourself as different from them? I didn't see myself different at all. I completely understood uh, many of the things that they had done, I had done. Mm -hmm. uh, the separation was I had an ID card that allowed me to go in and out. The separation was that Christ had done something in my life to yeah. separate me from my deeds, and they had yet not been separated. So for me and seeing them and discussing it with them, it was basically to make them see that the Christ that I serve could separate them from their yeah. deeds as well. It doesn't change what you've done, but it makes you understand who Christ is. When you became chaplain, there hadn't been an execution in a long, long time. Since then, you've experienced a dozen of them. What was that like for you the first time that you knew you had to walk through that with someone? Well, the first execution that I walked, that I was with, was Robert Alton Harris. And for me, it was troubling because Robert was on my caseload and I had developed a relationship with mm -hmm. him beyond just him being a prisoner. He was someone that I spent hours with. So for me to walk him into the chamber and him look at me and basically tell me it would be okay. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, you're getting ready to die and you're telling me it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. He stopped to talk to the officers and tell them it wasn't personal. They were just doing God's job. They were just doing their job. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was painful and something you never forget. You never yeah. forget watching someone die. That's a pretty intense experience. What, as you've experienced this numerous times, what are the last thoughts that a lot of these men have before they go to their execution? They reflect on what they've done. They reflect on the fact that it's close, and they reflect on what they could have done differently. Yeah. Uh, in our conversations, it's amazing how many of them will talk about 
their childhood and their mm -hmm. past and the pain that they've associated themselves with and the hurt that they had yeah. and how they transferred that. It's not that they, the deeds and the execution, that was a byproduct of their deeds. Uh, they talked about their yesterdays more than anything. We've just seen the Boston bomber sentenced to death at the same time Nebraska has banned the death sentence. You're someone who has walked the halls of all of this. What's your own personal position on the death penalty? Well, as I told my aunt, we, there's a guy on death row that one time was on my caseload that killed two of my relatives. Wow. And what I told her is, and she was saying, baby, you need to be there. And it's in the book, uh, when this guy is executed, and I said, why would you want to be there for that? I said, there's no, closure is not a part of the dialogue. And when someone is executed, that person dies, but do you really live on or are, you, or are there something lingering? For a lot of the people that have, vic that have been victimized by guys on death row, they're still held hostage by that crime. Every time there's an appeal, every time the mm -hmm. process takes place. So for me, in terms of releasing and letting go, I trust God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the process of all of that. You've played chess with Charles Manson. Got to ask you about that. <laughs> what is that like? Charles is a, Charles was a very interesting guy because I played chess with black guy, white guy, and Hispanic guy every week, and it was his turn. I said, okay, it's your turn, and he started screaming and yelling at me, and I walked away. The next week, I come back, and I say to, and he asked me, hey, are we going to play today? Well, he wasn't a very good chess player. <laughs> he had a really interesting mind, but he was not a good chess player, so I extended the game just so I could have a dialogue with him. Mm -hmm. And what I learned a little bit about his orphanage, about how he grew up, and some of his life. And yeah. for me, I used chess as a way to get to learn Charlie mm -hmm. a little bit better than the book and other things people had said. Wow, not many people have an opportunity for that. I want you to tell us a little bit about Project Impact because it's a powerful thing that you've established. Well, you know, Project Impact, we actually, I went to a Promise Keepers convention and I came back and I told the guys, I got something for you. And for me, in prison, race and religion separate. And so how do we bridge those two things to yeah. bring men together on a common call? So we started this thing with guys from different chapel clerks and different guys working in the area. And Project Impact is incarcerated men putting away childish things. Mm. And what we did was we decided that we would get together, be accountable, and work with each other. Uh, how do we get men to be accountable? So we came up with this, this theory called AIR, accountability, integrity, responsibility. Most people in prison choke because of toxic air. How do you clear the air up? Yeah. So those were the principles that we built it on. Well, you know, the same things that you talk about being divisive in prison seem to be divisive in our culture today. Maybe God's got bigger plans for your, your project than you might realize. You also say that men would never be paroled unless they could first envision themselves on the outside. What do you mean by that? Well, in many cases, people that are detained are locked up by their past. And because you're locked up by your past, you're held hostage by your yesterdays. Mm. And if you're held hostage by your yesterdays, you can't see your tomorrows. And so when I talked to the guys that were involved in our impact group, the founding fathers, mm -hmm. the founding members of that group, I told each of them, they're all doing life sentences. And I said, until you see yourselves out, mm. you'll never get released. Yeah. And each of those guys individually came back and told me where they were when they saw themselves out. And the amazing thing I talk about in the book is each of those guys, when they got out, they called me from those same locations that they saw themselves out at. Really? They were released. It Every guy that pass. was there. I want to mention, you're also the chaplain of the NBA's Golden State Warriors. They are on their way, hopefully, to a championship. What do you are say you to them? Are you praying with us on that? Well, I might be. I mean... <laughs> I am so excited about those kids. We have an unbelievable group of young men that are playing together. They love each other. They love what they're doing. And there's an unbelievable chemistry. And we won a game last night. And, you know, we have six more to win in order to have a yes. championship. And 
We Might just, just we're, the end of the tunnel, right? <laughs> we're believing for it. We're really yeah. believing for it. And I believe in for those young men that love each other. They love each other, and that's important. Very exciting. Well, Earl, God, you're, the story of what God's done in your life is just remarkable, really, and how he's used you. And, you know, God wants to do that with all of us. He takes our, our experiences in life and will use them to make the world a better place and to change people's lives. We want to thank you for being here and sharing a little bit of your story today. It is just a little bit of it, but you can read the whole thing by getting his book. It's called Death Row Chaplain. It's available nationwide wherever books are sold. Great read. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to have you here.